Okay, so one of the nicest things about category theory is that it allows us to find these relatively simple concepts which can be used to organise our thinking about so many different areas of human endeavour. So um, we can, just with a few sort of basic concepts from category theory, we can organise our knowledge of things like mathematics and computer science and engineering and linguistics and all sorts of things. And um, there's a few different ideas in category theory which really stand out um, as having so many different applications and kind of organising our thinking of the subject. And as far as um, like being a very kind of simple concept, with a lot of applications. I don't think anything beats the idea of a pullback or it's kind of dual notion of a push out, okay? And that's because there are just so many concepts in the rest of category theory that can be explained in terms of pullbacks. Once you know what pullbacks are and understand the kind of theory behind them, you sort of almost automatically understand so much about other parts of category theory. So let me give you a few examples of concepts which we can really fully understand in terms of pullbacks. So there are categorical products, equalizers, monics. In fact, any finite limits at all can be understood in terms of pullbacks. Um, we can also understand ideas like the intersections of sub-objects and also this kind of idea of inverse images of things under arrows, okay? Um, so there's all these ideas that can all be explained in terms of one particular concept and it's not an especially complicated concept. And also, I mean, there's a whole theory about how pullbacks can be combined together and this is so interesting because this concept is so pervasive. I mean, um, like topos theory is one of the most interesting areas of category theory. And that's um, a lot about studying monomorphisms and kind of sub-objects and what kind of properties they have in particular scenarios. But the way that they're studied in topos theory is almost all using this idea of pullbacks. So it's really such a powerful idea. And then there's this dual idea of a push out, um, which allows us to understand about finite co-limits, uh, co-products, co-equalizers, epics, and all sorts of other things, okay? So, but I mean, that's just the dual idea. So once we understand about the structure of pullbacks and we have an understanding of lots of the nice kind of theorems about them, we can just dualize them and get all of this understanding about push outs for free. So where do we start? Well, I think a good place to start, it's pretty clear, is with a definition of what a pullback is. Now, um, I've probably already mentioned the definition of a pullback before, and maybe the simplest way to say what a pullback is, um, is, that it would be a, a limit of a kind of diagram like this one shown in white here, okay? So when we have an object in our category and two arrows coming into that object, we call this resulting kind of diagram here, like this one here where we have an arrow F from A to C and an arrow G from B to C, we call that a corner, okay? So this thing shown in white here is a corner. And we can ask, what is a pullback of such a corner? And um, the short answer is, well, it's a limit of this diagram shown in white here. But um, let's be a bit more explicit about this um, because we're gonna focus so much on pullbacks today, okay? So basically the definition of what a pullback is in general is here. So the pullback of this corner here is going to consist of an object L, the kind of main object of our pullback, 
and that's going to have an arrow P1 into A and an arrow P2 into B in such a way that this inner square commutes, okay? So that means that F after P1 equals G after P2. So sometimes we'll call these kind of arrows, P1 and P2, we'll call them projections, okay? We often sort of borrow terminology from the ideas of the categorical product when we're talking about pullbacks. Um, so that's the basic structure of the pullback, but it has to have a kind of universal property that for any kind of candidate, so for anything sort of similar to this stuff, in particular, for any object X with an arrow I into A and an arrow J into B, such that F after I equals G after J. Um, for such a candidate, there's a unique arrow K from X to L, uh, which allows us to kind of emulate the effect of this phony kind of candidate here in the sense that I equals P1 after K and J equals P2 after K. So that's it. That's the general definition of what a pullback is. Um, in short, it is basically um, a object with an arrow into each of the kind of um, external pieces of our corner, which makes this square commute and is such that for any similar thing that makes this kind of thing commute, the outer um, diagram commute, there's a unique arrow K that makes the whole diagram commute. So that's the basic idea. And um, once you've gone through a few examples, you'll see um, that this is actually a fairly easy kind of framework to, um, to manipulate once you get used to it. And there's just so many different concepts that we can express using this idea of a pullback in this kind of abstract setup. So I want to give some kind of intuition about what pullbacks mean in general, but there's just so many different ways that they can be applied. And I think uh, this intuition is going to come across when we look at more detailed examples. So maybe the best way to start um, talking about pullbacks is to talk about what they are in the category of sets. OK, because this is a setting where we can really um, kind of get our hands on what's going on. So what does a pullback look like in the category of sets? Well, firstly, what's this kind of corner look like in the category of sets? Well, it's going to be a function F from set A to C and a function G from set B to C. So, OK, what's the pullback of this going to be then? Well, the main thing is this object L here. And what that's going to be in the category of sets, we can think of it as the set of pairs of a little a from this set capital A and a little b from this set capital B, such that doing f on the little a gives the same result as doing g on the little b. Um, and then this p1 here, we can just think of it as a projection sending a pair to its first element and P2 sending this pair to the second element, little b. Um, and then this kind of intermediary arrow works in a pretty similar way to how it works in the categorical product, okay? So one thing that I really like about pullbacks is that if you're interested in kind of linguistics and describing, you know, what phrases mean and stuff like that, um, then you can use pullbacks um, with this idea of so-called ontology logs, which is basically just kind of like um, a fancy way of talking about the category of sets. Um, and you can then use this idea of pullbacks to give kind of definitions of lots of real world things. So what's the idea? The idea is basically that we have these objects that we label with these indefinite noun phrases. And we think of these as sets, okay? So for example, a car um, represents the set of all cars. Um, an amount of fuel rep represents the set of all amounts of fuel, okay? And so on. Um, and then these arrows here, these are basically representing functions. So a function from this set to this set. But 
we can think of this in a more kind of English language friendly way um, as thinking of these arrows as aspects of these things described by these indefinite noun phrases. So these arrows can be thought of as like a way that the thing on the source can be regarded or measured. OK, um, and this just gives us a nice way of connecting kind of um, real world language with the goings on in the category of sets or maybe even some more elaborate category if you if you want to set up that kind of framework. Um, so, for example, when you say a car has an amount of fuel, you can think that there's a kind of function associating every car with some amount of fuel. OK. Um, and the nice thing is that if you make a kind of corner um, using a setup like this, so you kind of um, think of three kind of indefinite noun phrases and the way that these kind of A type things um, can be regarded or measured in C and a way that these B type things can, um, then you have one of these corners, okay? And then you can just make a pullback of it. And often when you do that, um, you get some kind of concept which is like familiar or natural in the world. So all we do then is we just use this kind of idea, this um, new kind of object in our pullback, this top left corner, is just the set of pairs of something from this set paired with something from this set, such that doing this function on the first entry in the pair gives the same result as doing this function on the second entry in the pair. Um, and so in this case, um, this is going to be the set of all cars paired with an amount of diesel such that the car has as the amount of fuel uh, the same thing that the amount of diesel is. OK, so basically um, I would say that this really represents the set of diesel cars. Simple as that. OK, these are cars that have an amount of fuel which belongs to the car and is also diesel. Um, but it's nice that we can kind of at least go towards this concept of what a diesel car is um, in such a kind of mathematically rigorous way as a kind of pullback of this kind of setup. Now, um, I know that this isn't watertight. Um, there could be various issues um, lurking behind the language, but at least when you build these ontology logs, um, it kind of because you're forced to think of everything in terms of well-defined functions and things like that, it kind of um, allows you to see any kind of ambiguities that might be hiding behind the language. And um, I encourage you to play around uh, making these kind of ontology logs and see what other concepts you can define using this idea of a pullback. So this is a sort of rough sketch about how pullbacks work in the category of sets. Um, and this intermediary arrow K, it sort of works like this. So it sends an element of X to uh, I after that element, comma J after that element. Um, and just a couple of other things to say about terminology. Um, this object L here is really the kind of main thing that the pullback's about in some sense. And uh, sometimes it's denoted as A times B, but with this kind of time symbol with a kind of subscript C to represent that this object's playing a special role. I've also seen this kind of notation for a pullback, which I think is probably slightly superior. It's uh, A times B, but the times has a subscript F comma G, because it's really these arrows F comma F and G that are really sort of um, setting up, you know, what the structure of uh, this special kind of pullback object is. And um, also, you may see people write this intermediary arrow K here as I comma J, just the same way as it's written in the case of categorical products. So this is the basic idea of a pullback. And in this video, we're going to talk about what pullbacks are and how all these other interesting concepts relate to them.
and then there's this dual idea of a push out and I'll leave a lot of that to you to kind of take these results and dualize them for yourself and understand how all this theory applies um, for push outs and co-products and co-equalizers and epics and things like that and um, it's well worth doing that because the proofs and the thinking is easy it's just dualizing uh, this theory of pullbacks I'm going to explain but the, the theory itself that you get out of it uh, looks quite different because these dual concepts um, can look rather different and have different sorts of interesting implications. Okay so one of the nicest things about this idea of pullbacks is that we can describe lots of other important concepts in category theory in terms of pullbacks. So one very important idea is the notion of the categorical product of a pair of objects. So say we have an object A and an object B and we want to describe the categorical product of A and B. Well how can we do that using pullbacks? Well the basic idea is pretty simple. Um, if we have a terminal object we can just put the terminal object there and consider this arrow exclamation mark A from A to the terminal object and this one exclamation mark B from B to the terminal object and we have this corner here and we have this corner here shown in white so now if we simply find the pullback of this corner that will actually give us the categorical product that we're after now of course for this kind of thing to be possible there actually has to exist a pullback for such a corner and um, but in many uh, important categories we will have a pullback for any corner at all and as we shall see that implies the existence of lots of other um, very important kind of category theory gadgetry which can be made out of pullbacks and so here we're making the categorical product of a and b and I claim that this is basically going to be this object L, this object of our pullback. So how can we see it? Well, my claim is that L is going to be the categorical product of A and B. And these arrows P1 and P2 involved in this pullback, in this case, are also going to correspond with the projections P1 and P2, which we'd think of in the context of L being the categorical product of A and B. So all we really have to do is check that L and P1 and P2 look like the categorical product of A and B. So do they satisfy all the requirements? Well, firstly, of course, P1 is an arrow from L to A and P2 is an arrow from L to B. So that's good. We want the product of A and B to have an arrow into A and an arrow into B. But we also want it to have this kind of universal property. So let's say we have some other object X with an arrow I into A and an arrow J into B. Well, we want there to exist this unique intermediary arrow then that makes this diagram commute. So is that the case? Well, it is because say we have such a candidate X, well, then he, let's think of it being up here. Now we'll automatically have the exclamation mark A after I equals exclamation mark B after J. Because composing these is just the arrow from X to the terminal object and there's only one such arrow. So it must also be equal to the composition of these two arrows. So that's fine. Um, we have for an X with an I like this and a, and a J like this, that this outer um, perimeter of this diagram commutes. And therefore, the definition of a pullback, remember we're supposing that this is a pullback, 
well, the definition of a pullback says we have a unique K, which is going to be such that P1 after K equals I, P1 after K equals I, and P2 after K equals J, P2 after K equals J. So that's all we need to do. Um, that shows that um, in this case where we set these arrows involved in our corner to just be arrows into the terminal object, when we construct this pullback, we're actually just constructing the categorical product of A and B. So now we see that categorical products is really just a special case of pullbacks. Okay, so now it's time for one of the most interesting results about pullbacks. And this has to do with the kind of interaction between pullbacks and monomorphisms. So in general, a pullback is going to be constructed using some corner, using some diagram consisting of two arrows converging on the same object. Now, um, we have some special terminology. So, I mean, when we've made a pullback, we essentially make this kind of square here. We sometimes call this the pullback square. And sometimes we'll refer to this projection arrow here, P1, that's part of our pullback, as the pullback of G along F, okay? Because it's part of the pullback square. It's one of these kind of newly found projection arrows and it's opposite G in the square. So we can think about getting this arrow by sort of pulling this arrow back along F like so. And in a similar way, P2 could be considered to be the kind of pullback of F along G like so. Um, and so, so this is very kind of interesting and suggestive terminology and it's a good thing to think about. Um, but it's even more kind of interesting when G is a monomorphism, okay? So we can ask, what's the pullback of a monomorphism along an arrow F? And in sort of plain English, what we're saying here is that um, if we have a diagram like this, so we have an arrow F from A to C and an arrow G from B to C, and we find the pullback of this, then are there going to be any special properties of this arrow P1 here involved in this pullback? And the answer is yes. P1 actually has to be a monomorphism, okay? And this is a really deep result because it has to do with calculating inverse images of things. It has to do with determining the intersections of things. It has huge um, interplay with the ideas of logic that we'll encounter when we start doing topos theory um, in subsequent videos. It's a very important idea. So I'll say again, the main thing we want to understand here is that the pullback of a monomorphism along with an arrow is another monomorphism. We want to prove that P1 is, mono, is a monomorphism. And um, just before I get into the proof, um, I'll just say that this um, picture is basically how this sort of thing will look in the category of sets, okay? So when we have this monomorphism G from B into C, we think of this as an inclusion function. We can basically just think of B as a subset of C. And then we have this function F, from A to C, and um, this so-called um, pullback of G along F, I claim it's a monomorphism. So again, we can think of it as a subset of A. And in fact, we can call it the inverse image of B along F, because it's basically in this example of sets, it's the set of stuff that gets sent it's for set of stuff in A, it's for set, it's for subset of elements of A that get sent to things in B under this function F. Okay, that's how we can interpret P1 
um, when we're working in the category of sets. That's how we can interpret this monomorphism. Um, but I'll say much more about that later. Let's just focus on the general case now. We, we want to show in general that when we have a pullback um, of a diagram like this one shown in white, where G is a monomorphism, we want to show that P1 is a monomorphism in general. Okay, so this is an important argument, so let's do it. Um, so we start with the usual way that we start proving that something is a monomorphism. We start by assuming that there are parallel arrows, X and Y, coming into the source of P1. And we start by supposing that P1 after X equals P1 after Y. And we want to arrive at the conclusion that X equals Y. So, okay, what do we know? Well, we know that this square commutes, okay, because we're assuming we have a pullback. So we know that F after P1 equals G after P2. So if we take this equation and we compose it with X on the right-hand side, then we get that these two things are equal. Now we also know that P1 after, now we're also assuming that P1 after X equals P1 after Y. So if we get this equation and we compose it with F on the left-hand side, then we get that F after P1 after X equals F after P1 after Y. And similarly, if we get this equation here and we compose it with G on the left, we get G after P2 after X equals G after P2 after Y. So we have that all of these four things are equal, okay? So what do we do next? Well, the next thing we do is notice that that means that these two things are equal. We must have that G after P2 after X equals G after P2 after Y. So what? Well, what do we know about G? We're assuming that G is a monomorphism, right? So what does this give us? This gives us that P2 after X equals P2 after Y. Okay, um, so I, um, I want to introduce some new symbols just to make it easy to think about. So we know we have P1 after X is P1 after Y. So let's call either of those things alpha. And we also have P2 after X equals P2 after Y. So let's call either of those things beta. Now, here's the thing. Now, here's the thing. We have here, just using these first two expressions here, we have the F after P1 after X equals G after P2 after X. But we're saying that let's think of P1 after X as alpha, okay? So we have F of alpha on the left. It's just making uh, this substitution here. And then we have that P2 after X is beta over here. So this is G after beta. So, basically we have F after alpha is G after beta. And so, here's alpha, and here's beta. So the important thing is that we have F after alpha equals G after beta. Um, so what? Well, the point is basically that these arrows, alpha and beta, which are coming out of H here, um, are essentially forming a kind of candidate for being the pullback of this white diagram here. 
And so what? Well, what that means is there has to exist this unique arrow K. Which has got to be such that P1 after K is equal to alpha and P2 after K is equal to beta has to satisfy these equations here. But remember, we know that alpha is equal to P1X and is also equal to P1Y. And we know that beta is equal to P2X is equal to P2Y, okay? So the conclusion is that having K is equal to X or having K equal to Y satisfies both of these equations here. And the point is that there's only supposed to be one K that satisfies both of these lines of equalities, okay? Um, so what we're saying is that you can solve both of these kind of things. So what I'm saying is you can solve this kind of system with k equals x, or you can solve it with k equals y, but there's only supposed to be one solution. The only conclusion then must be that x equals y. So we started with this assumption here that p1 after x equals p1 after y, and we ended with this conclusion that x equals y. And that shows that P1 is indeed a monomorphism. We'll see more justification for this later, but just to say another name for this P1 here, what we might write is we might call it the inverse image of G along F, okay? Because if we think of G as really specifying our subobject, I mean, I know I labeled it with a B there, but in some labeling, I could have labeled it with a G because it's really the monomorphism which is describing this kind of part here. Um, then, you know, we can think of this as kind of the stuff in A that gets sent into this subobject. So if we're labeling this subobject with a G, we can rightly think of this as f to the minus one of g. Um, and so this is basically how you find the inverse image of an arrow in a general kind of category. Okay then, so to continue this kind of exhibition of the power of pullbacks, I now want to demonstrate how this idea of equalizers can be understood in terms of pullbacks. In particular, um, say we want to find an equaliser of a pair of parallel arrows, say arrows F and G from an object A to an object B, in some category which has all these pullbacks for every corner. Well, we can do that. We can find a pullback which essentially gives us this equaliser arrow E, which we are after. So all we need to know is how to set up this kind of corner that we want to take a pullback of. And what we do, we take our object A, we take the product of B with itself, and then we have this kind of pair arrow, um, the pair of F comma G, okay? So this is a normal arrow which occurs in products. And we also have this so-called diagonal arrow, identity B comma identity B. And that's an arrow from B into B times B. We could consider this to be the graph of the identity function, if you want to uh, make some connections with what we talked about in, uh, towards the end of the last video. OK. Um, anyway, the point is that we simply have this white diagram now. And if we just take the pullback of it, then this arrow E over here is exactly this equalizer, which we're looking for, okay? So how do we know this? Well, 
let's just suppose we have all this structure I've described in white. Um, you know, this structure made considering these kind of uh, parallel arrows F and G that we want to find the equalizer of. So we suppose we have this white sort of corner here, this diagram here. And um, let's just suppose that we've got a pullback of this now. Um, so we'll call the object of the pullback E and this first projection arrow, we'll call it little e. And the second projection arrow as usual, we'll call P2. So because this is a pullback, one thing that we're going to have is that F comma G after E is going to be equal to identity B comma identity B after P2. And what does that mean? Well, we can just, um, what does that mean? Well, these kind of angle bracket arrows are just as interpreted, uh, well, these angle bracket arrows here are just things to do with ordinary categorical products. So we know how to handle things like this. We can just take these things inside the brackets. This is getting to be quite a familiar algebraic operation to us by now. So we can rewrite this. This is equal to F after E, comma G after E. And that's equal to P2, comma P2. So we must have that F after E equals P2 equals G after E. So that's good um, because now we know that F after E equals G after E. We know that E equalizes F and G, but that's not enough to know that E is an equalizer. We now have to show that this E has this kind of universal property. So suppose we have some other arrow C from X to A, which is such that F after C equals G after C. Well, we want to then show that there exists a unique intermediary arrow that if we do E after the intermediary arrow, we get C. So, okay, let's now suppose then that we have this arrow C from X to A, such that F after C equals G after C. So what do we do now? Well, now we go back to our pullback uh, diagram and we say, okay, well, let's think about our X being this object up here and we'll have our arrow C from X to A. And remember, we're assuming that F after C equals G after C. So um, we want to actually make a proper sort of pullback candidate. So let's define this arrow up here to be F after C. And then hopefully you can see that because of this, we have that the outer diagram of this commutes. OK, so let's just check. I claim that F comma G after C is equal to 1B comma 1B after FC. And um, that makes sense because this on the right is just uh, FC comma FC and this on the left is just FC comma GC that FC equals GC so clearly those are equal okay so um, setting it up like this we've now made a proper pullback candidate this arrow X 
with this arrow C into A and this arrow F after C into B. And so now we just use the universal property of our pullback because now we know that there exists a unique K such that such that E after K equals C and P2 after K equals FC. So we know now that there exists this K such that E after K equals C. So, okay, we've shown how to construct a K like this, such that E after K equals C. Um, but how do we know that this K is constructed like this is unique? How do we know that there isn't more than one K um, which could make this kind of triangle commute? Well, I think the easiest way to see this is um, to use another result about pullbacks, a result which we'll prove shortly, which is that the pullback of any monic is monic. When we have a diagram like the one shown in white, um, and when we do a pullback of it, we're sort of making a square, okay? We're making a so-called pullback square. And the arrow opposite one of the arrows in our diagram is sometimes called the pullback of this arrow along the other arrow of the diagram, okay? So imagine literally pulling this arrow along like that. So we'd regard E to be the pullback of identity B comma identity B along F comma G, okay? And it's a well-known result about pullbacks that the pullback of a monic along the other arrow of the diagram is another monic. So since this arrow is monic because it's a graph, okay? Um, it turns out that this arrow E is also monic. Um, so how does that result help us? Well, because we know that E is monic, I mean, E should be monic, right? Because we're trying to claim that it's an equalizer, but that's something that we're trying to arrive at, okay? Um, anyway, we do know from this argument about pullbacks that E is monic. So how does that help us? Well, we know that E is monic because this is monic and we've now found a K which is such that E after K equals C. And so now we know that this must be the only such K because if, if there was another K which was also similar like E after K dash equals C, then the fact that E is monic would imply that K equals K dash. So yes, we do have that there is a unique uh, kind of intermediary arrow, which allows us to mimic this C, which is equalizing F and G. So indeed, this arrow E, which is constructed basically by pulling back this diagonal arrow along F comma G, is indeed the equalizer of these parallel arrows F and G. Okay then, so we want to understand more about these kind of inverse images, because this is a very interesting concept. I mean, in the category of sets, this idea is quite familiar, that we have some kind of a function from one set to another, and we have some kind of subset of this target, which is selected. And then we're able to find the kind of inverse image of this subset along this arrow, this function here. And that's gonna be a subset of our source object. And in the kind of category theory language, what we're saying essentially is that when we do a pullback of this monic here along F, in other words, when we calculate the pullback of this white kind of diagram here with a monic here, 
Um, what we get over here is another monic, and that can be considered the kind of inverse image of G along F, or we could say it's the pullback of this monic G along F. And so the thing is, um, as I've said in these videos before, when we have a monic, it's a good idea to think about what arrows are in it, okay? Because we can really characterize monics by what arrows are in them. And so since we've sort of made a monic over here, this one that I'm calling f to the minus one of g, you can think of this just as a, um, some fancy name for this arrow, okay? It seems like a good name because it is really the inverse image of g along f, as this kind of argument will um, encourage, as this kind of argument I'm about to make will suggest. But anyway, we have this monic which we're calling f to the minus 1 of g, and um, the thing we're going to ask now is when is an arrow, a general arrow x with the same target as this red arrow here, when is this arrow x going to be in this arrow f to the minus 1 of g? And the remarkable claim is this, that x is going to be in f to the minus 1 of g if and only if f after x is in g. Okay, so consider the case when we're dealing with sets. Let's just go back and think about this example with sets again. So in this case, g here um, would be representing, g here would be basically corresponding to a subset of C. And this kind of inverse image thing, we could think of this as the set of elements of A, such that doing F on those elements gives us something in B. And we've basically got the same kind of thing going on in here. It's just rather than talking about elements, we're talking about arrows, okay? We're saying that an arrow X is going to be in this sub-object, f to the minus 1 of g, if and only if doing f on that arrow gives us an arrow which is in this sub-object, g. So the arrows that are in here are precisely the arrows that if we do f on them, give us arrows which are in here. Okay, um, so this is quite a nice claim because it really lets us understand this idea of inverse images um, in a much more kind of arrow-centric way and um, in a very kind of general way that applies to all sorts of monics. So what's the proof of this then? Well, we want to show for a general arrow h from x to a that x is in f to the minus 1 of g if and only if f after x is in g. So let's go. We'll suppose that x is in f to the minus 1 of g. Now this implies that there exists a k such that x equals f to the minus 1 of g after k. That's just what this in notation means. It just means that there exists a k that makes a triangle like this commute, okay? Um, so that's fine. But now, if you think about it, we have that f after x can be rewritten as f after f to the minus 1 of g after k. And also, since we have a pullback square, we know that this square has to commute. So, we can rewrite this as g after p2 after k because f after f to the minus 1 of g equals g after p2. Okay, so we have the f after x is equal to g after p2 after k. And now if we think about this, we see that f after x is equal to g after something. Okay, that something being p2 after k. So that means that f after x is in g, and that's what we wanted. Okay, so we've now shown that this 
implies this. So that's fine, but now we want to go the other way around. We want to show that saying that f is in g, that implies that x is in f to the minus 1 of g. So let's do that. Well, okay then, let's now go for the converse. So we're now going to suppose that f after x is in g. So what does that mean? Well, that means that there should exist some u such that f after x is equal to g after u. So we have this, okay. Um, and now, if you think about it, we have this outer perimeter of this diagram is commuting. And then by the definition of a pullback, that means that there has to exist this, exi this unique arrow, which we'll call L, which makes this whole diagram commute, okay? And one of the things that implies is that f to the minus 1 of g after L equals x. f to the minus 1 of g after L equals x. And that just implies that x is in f to the minus 1 of g. So we've now shown that this implies this, and that this implies this. So we're done. So this is a very useful result. Um, for example, if you're working in one of these categories of functors from C to set, um, maybe you have like F as a graph homomorphism, for example. Um, this allows you to calculate the kind of inverse images of um, this allows you to sort of calculate the inverse images of subobjects in these kind of categories. Because, you know, thinking about arrows X, which come from HOM functors, allow you to um, determine whether bits and pieces are in these inverse images via the Yo needle lemma. But I'm not going to talk about set to the power of C too much in this video. I just wanted to mention that there's some useful applications to this kind of result. Okay then, so we've just proved this result, that if we have a monic arrow g and a monic arrow f to the minus 1 of g, and if f to the minus 1 of g is the pullback of g along this arrow f from a to c, then this statement in white holds that for any arrow x into a, we have that x is in f to the minus 1 of g, if and only if f after x is in g. So we've basically shown that given this statement in red about these two things being monic, um, we have that if this statement in green holds, then this statement in white holds. Now, it turns out that we can also prove the kind of opposite result to this. We can show that the result in white implies the result in green under the assumption in red here. So basically what this does is it gives us a, a completely different way to think about the inverse image of an arrow, a way which is completely kind of arrow membership centric that doesn't even talk about pullbacks, okay? Because basically we can just use this condition here in white um, as a kind of necessary and sufficient condition for this monic f to the minus 1 of g to be the pullback, to be the inverse image of g along this arrow f. So remember, this f to the minus 1 of g is nothing but notation. You know, I could have called this alpha or anything. Um, so what I now want to show is that this statement in white implies this statement in green. So what I want to show is that for a monic G going from some object B to C and for a monic, which I'm just calling F to the minus one of G, which let's say goes from some object I'll call 
f to the minus 1 of b. Again, I could call this anything, but whatever. It goes from that to a. Um, what we have is that if this statement in white holds true, if for any arrow into a, for any arrow x into a, we have x is in this monic, if and only if x is in this monic, then we have this statement in white holding true, that f to the minus 1 of g is the pullback of g along f. Okay, so I'm saying that not only does this green statement imply this white statement, but also this white statement here implies this green statement. So we're going to assume this white statement here, and we're actually going to construct this pullback. So this should be quite educational because it, it tells us about how we can actually infer that pullbacks exist. Um, which is quite useful often. So um, what do we do then? Well, we want to use this result and we want to make a pullback. So um, what do we start with? Well, what we know to begin with is that we have this monic G from B to C and we have this arrow F from A to C and we have this monic F to the minus one of G from f to the minus 1 of b to a. And um, firstly, we want to show that these kind of things can be made into a pullback square. So we want an arrow from f to the minus 1 of b to b. So how are we going to get it? Well, the only thing that we have at our disposal is this white statement here. So all we really can do is keep using this idea that x is in f to the minus 1 of g, if and only if f after x is in g. So can we think of some arrow that's in f to the minus 1 of g? Well, yeah. How about f to the minus 1 of g? Any monic is in itself. Okay, so we do have that f to the minus 1 of g is in f to the minus 1 of g. And now... Using this white statement, we know that doing f on this should give us something in g. So we have that f after f to the minus 1 of g is in g. Well, what does that mean? That means there exists some arrow, which we'll call p2. It's just a name, okay? It means there's an arrow p2. which is such that f after f to the minus 1 of g is equal to g after p2. Okay, so now we have a commuting square, at least. But how do we know that this is a pullback? Well, let's suppose that we have a candidate, okay? So we'll suppose we have some object h with an arrow L into A and an arrow U into B. So we have a H with arrows L and U like this. Um, and we'll suppose it's such that F after L equals G after U. Okay, so the perimeter of this diagram commutes. So what we want to do now is to show that there's a unique arrow from H to F to the minus one of B which is going to make the whole diagram commute, okay? So how are we going to do that? Well, notice that we're assuming now that f after l equals g after u. So that means that f after l is in g, okay? So we have something in g, so we can now use this result in white again to say, aha, that must mean that L is in F to the minus 1 of G. In other words, there must exist a K such that L is equal to F to the minus 1 of G after K. 
So we have that there exists this k such that L is equal to f to the minus 1 of g after k. In fact, we can do better. We know that the k that makes this happen is actually unique. There's only one k, which is such that f to the minus 1 of g after k equals L. How do we know that? Well, we know that because f to the minus 1 of g is, by assumption, monic. Okay, so if we had also that L equals f to the minus 1 of g of, let's say, k dash, well, the fact that f to the minus 1 of g is monic would mean that k equals k dash. So there's only one k that can make this triangle commute here. So we're nearly there. All we have to do now um, to complete our argument that we have a pullback square is to show that this k that we've constructed also makes this top triangle commute. So we want to show that P2 after K equals U. So okay then, all we need to do to finish our argument is to show that U equals P2 after K. We just need to show that this unique K that we've found that makes this triangle commute also makes this upper triangle commute. So how are we going to do it? Well, let's start by considering this composition, G after P2 after K. That's these arrows composed like this. Now, since we know that this square commutes, we can rewrite this as F after F to the minus one of G after K. Now, since we know that this triangle commutes, we can rewrite this as F after L. And now, since we know that the outer perimeter of this diagram commutes, we know that F after L is equal to G after U. So the important thing is that G after P2 after K equals G after U. And can you guess the final step to this argument? G is monic, so this implies that P2 after K is equal to U, which means that this top triangle commutes and we're done. Okay, so we've shown that if we have this statement in white, then it implies that F to the minus 1 of G, this arrow, which we're just calling that, is indeed the pullback of G along this arrow F from A to C. So we have these two um, really rather different looking equivalent ways to talk about the kind of inverse image of a monic. When, and being able to make this kind of correspondence is going to be really useful to us uh, when we start thinking about sub-object classifiers, because it's going to give us these two um, rather different and useful viewpoints to think about them from. Oh, it's also um, worth thinking about something else. I, I don't see this much in the literature, um, but it always seems to me that like this notation, for example, um, saying that an arrow M is in G. Well, um, people normally use this notation for the case where G is monic. But if you just use this notation, just as sort of um, shorthand to mean that there exists a K such that um, M is equal to G after K. I mean, at least in theory, there's no reason why you can't use this notation um, in cases where G is not monic. And it's interesting to investigate then how far arguments like this go when these arrows like G and f to the minus 1 of g are not necessarily monic. And it's quite interesting that, like, sometimes you can take these arguments where we kind of insist that things are monic, and if you just sort of expand your usage of this notation um, to include arrows that are not monic, sometimes you still get coherent results. So you can sort of generalize things in some sense. But anyway, I'm mostly going to use this notation in cases where G is monic and 
you know, in this case, of course, that I've gone through, um, I have relied on the fact that G is monic or F to the minus one is monic, some, or F to the minus one of G is monic at some points. So one needs to carefully check arguments if one needs to, so one needs to carefully check arguments if one wants to make this kind of generalization. Okay, so now we get on to what's one of the most interesting kind of applications of pullbacks and that is okay so now we're going to get on to what's one of the most interesting applications of pullbacks and that is to determine the intersection of two monics okay so a lot of this content is building up to topos theory which we're going to get on to in subsequent videos and in topos theory we're going to consider categories that have enough structure that we're going to be able to do the familiar logical operations and do the kind of analogies of set theoretic operations like intersections and unions and so on but it's very interesting to see what kind of operations you can do with less machinery okay so um in particular we don't need all of the machinery that is present in a category which is a topos to be able to talk about intersections no in order to be able to talk about the intersection of two sub objects we only really need the idea of pullbacks okay i'm not even sure we need that but certainly with pullbacks we can talk about the notion of the intersection of two sub objects so um let me give you this important definition then um let's say we have a corner like this okay so we have a monic f from a to c and a monic g from b to c and um let's suppose we take the limit of this white diagram here so we get this red diagram now suggestively we're going to call this object involved in our pullback A intersection B. And um, of course, we know that these arrows P1 and P2 are going to be monics um, because we know that the pullback of a monic along an arrow is a monic. OK, so then how do we define the intersection of F and G? Well, we can define it to be this arrow here so we call this diagonal arrow f intersection g now um we can think of this arrow as either f after p1 or g after p2 they're the same because the outer square commutes so let's define f intersection g as f after p1 so this is a monic of c of course um this kind of construction won't usually uniquely define this arrow f intersection g um, because these pullbacks are uh, defined up to a kind of isomorphism um, but it defines f intersection g up to the kind of equivalence of monics and we're actually going to see other ways that we can characterize this monic as well um, but a good way to think of it to begin with is when you have two monics with the same target and you pull one monic back along another monic you get a pullback square if you take this diagonal of the pullback square going into the target of your monics then that arrow there that will be a monic because it's the composition of monics and um, we can consider that to be the intersection of f and g um, now why would we call this an intersection what does it have to do with intersecting monics well uh, what does this arrow have to do with being the intersection of this subobject and this subobject well think about sets okay so the intersection of two sets has the property that something's in it if and only if so the, so think about sets, okay? The intersection of two subsets has the property that an element will be in it 
if and only if it's in the first set and in the second set. And we see that this F cap G arrow here has very similar properties. So in particular, let's suppose we have any arrow from some object H into C. Now, the thing I want to convince you of is that X is going to be in this arrow, F cap G, if and only if X is in F and X is in G. So for this reason, um, it makes sense to think of this F cap G thing, this kind of monomorphism here, to be kind of like the intersection of this monomorphism F and this monomorphism G, because the things in it, the arrows in it, are precisely those which are in F and in G. So for example, if we're in the category of sets and we consider the case where H is the terminal object, um, this kind of condition says that something is going to be an element of this sub-object, if and only if it's an element of F and an element of G. But this, of course, is a, but this kind of relationship is, of course, something much more general, something that applies for arrows from any object H and works in any category, okay? Okay, so before I go into the proof of this, let's try and just build up a bit more intuition about why the intersection of these monics might be constructed like this. Um, so let's think about the category of sets. And we'll think about our original situation. We can consider B to be a subset of C, like so. And we also have this monomorphism F from A to C, like so. Now, how can we then think about this pullback square? Well, we can think about it as the pullback of G along F. In other words, we could consider uh, P1 to be the inverse image of G along F, like so. Okay, so if we think about this function F, and then this is sending elements of A into C, and um, there's going to be a certain sort of subset of C picked out by this G, a subset that we can call B. And if we look at the elements of A that get sent into elements of B, um, that's basically what this object that we're calling A intersection B is. OK, so this is another way to think about what intersections are in sets in terms of pulling back. In terms of sort of taking the inverse image of some subset of a set along one of these kind of monomorphism functions. OK, anyway, that's just something to mull over. Let's get on to the important thing, which is this result, because this is a very powerful result. So we want to prove that given this F intersection G arrow here that's constructed, as I described, you know, by forming this pullback square and taking this diagonal, we want to prove that for any object H and any arrow X from H to C, we have X is in F cap G if and only if X is in F and X is in G. So let's start by assuming this blue statement and we'll try and imply the green statement. OK, so so we'll start by assuming that X is in F cap G. So what that means then is it means there has to exist some K such that X is equal to F cap G after K. But we've already said that F cap G is basically just special notation for F after P1. OK, so we could rewrite this to say X is equal to F after P1 after K. And also we know that F after P1 is G after P2. So we can also write this as G after P2 after K. 
And then since x is equal to f after p1 after k, we must have the x's in f. And since x is equal to g after p2 after k, we must have the x's in g. So we've got that this blue statement here implies this green statement. So now let's finish the proof. Let's go the other way around. So let's suppose we have this green statement holding. We'll suppose that x is in f and x is in g. So that means there has to exist an L such that x equals f after L. And also there has to exist a u such that x is equal to g after u. But now here's the thing. We have that f after L is equal to g after u is equal to x. OK, so what that means basically is we can think of H with this arrow L into A and U into B as a kind of candidate for being a pullback. So we know that A intersection B with its projection arrows is the real deal. That is the pullback. But this H here is like a candidate. So that means there has to exist this arrow K from H to A cap B. which is going to be such that L is equal to P1 after K and U is equal to P2 after K. So all we do now is we take this equation and then what we're going to do is we're going to compose on the left hand side with an F. So we get F after L equals F after P1 after K. And we know that F after L is equal to x. And we also know that f after p1 is equal to f cap g. So what we get is that x is equal to f cap g after k. And that means that x is in f cap g. And so we've done. We've proved this result. Now there's something else that's very interesting. It's worth pointing out because it gives us yet another way. So there's something else very interesting that's worth pointing out because it gives us another way of thinking about what the intersection of two monics is. Um, because there's a way to think about it which basically doesn't involve using pullbacks directly. And it goes like this. Suppose we have some monomorphism alpha say from some object W, whatever, uh, but some monomorphism alpha going into C. Well, the thing is that um, what we're going to have is that alpha is going to be equivalent to F cap G if and only if we have that for any arrow X from any H into C, we have x is in alpha if and only if x is in f and x is in g. So what I'm writing here is just a copy of what I wrote here in green. Um, so why is this the case? Well, the reason that this is the case is because if you remember, um, when we have two monomorphisms, they're equivalent precisely when they have the same arrows in them. OK, so if for any object H, we have that X is in one monic, if and only if X is in the other monic, that precisely means that those two monics are equivalent to each other. OK. Um, OK, and so when alpha is such that. Member, so when OK, so when alpha is such that X is going to be in alpha, if and only if X is in F and X is in G, that means X is going to be in alpha if and only if 
x is in f cap g and that means f cap g and alpha are going to be equivalent to each other okay so essentially what this is telling us is that we can think of the intersection of two monics simply as a monic that has the property that an arrow is in it if and only if it's in either of the two arrows which we're intersecting because this property in green here really defines this intersection um, of f and g up to isomorphism i mean obviously we want to have this holding from for any arrows x from any object h so basically what this tells us so basically what this gives us is an even simpler way to think about what the intersection of two monics is if we have a monic f and a monic g with the same target then we can consider their intersection to just be another monic with the same target a monic that we might call f cap g with the property that for any arrow x into c we have the x is in f cap g if and only if x is in f and x is in g because i mean these kind of in conditions when they hold for any kind of arrow x they essentially define what this kind of monomorphism is up to equivalence and we're only really defining what this intersection concept is up to equivalence anyway with this pullback notion which is an alternative way to define f cap g it's pretty interesting to have this way of talking about the intersection of two sub objects of some object x especially when it gives us other ways to talk about other interesting kinds of um, relationships that monics can have so one of these is when a monic a is contained in a monic b and remember that's basically just and remember this basically just happens when a is in b in the sense that there's an arrow k which incidentally has to be monic as well um, such that b after k equals a um, so the interesting thing is that exactly like in sets we have this result that we can describe when one subobject is in another subobject in terms of this kind of intersection idea so if you think about two subsets a and b of some set x then indeed we have that a is contained in b if and only if the intersection of a and b is just a okay um, but it's remarkable that we also have this same result holding in general okay so to see this we just note that we have these equivalent sort of arrow membership based ways of saying these two different things when we say that these two monics this one here and this one here are equivalent what we're saying is that an arrow a general arrow v from some object h into x is going to be in this monic if and only if it's in this monic okay so that's what this arrow here means so we're saying that um, so that's what this arrow here means and an arrow v is going to be in a intersection b if and only if v is in a and v is in b and so and so we have that a intersection b is equivalent to a if and only if this general arrow v is going to be such that v is in a and v is in b which is just another way of saying v is in a intersection b if and only if v is in a so in other words this is true if and only if we have that v is in here is equivalent to v is in here so okay this is a long-winded way of saying this statement here um, and we can do another similar kind of trick for this statement here that a is contained in b we can look at the sort of um, arrow membership based way of writing this 
temperatures equivalent. And that is to say that for any of these general arrows V, we have that V is in A implies V is in B. That's just a kind of arrow-based equivalent way of saying that this monic A is contained in this monic B. And now we have these two statements, we can just see that they're equivalent just by ordinary reasoning, okay? Because this one says that V is in A implies V is in B. And this statement says V is in A and V is in B happens if and only if V is in A. So let's just show that these two things are equivalent. So um, let's suppose this one. So we'll suppose that V is in A implies V is in B. We'll suppose that that's true. And we want to prove this statement at the bottom here. So we want to prove that this implies this and that this implies this. Well, obviously, this implies this, uh, because if V is in A and V is in B, then obviously V is in A. So we've got that this statement on the left implies this statement on the right. How do we go the other way around? Well, suppose V is in A. Um, so we have V is in A, but we're also supposing that V is in A implies V is in B. So we also have V is in B. So since we're assuming this statement at the top, we also have this statement on the right implies this statement on the left. So we have that assuming this statement on the top, we can prove this statement down here. So we've shown that this top statement implies this bottom statement. Now we just have to go the other way around. So we suppose this bottom statement and we want to show that V implies A. And we want to show that V is in A implies V is in B. So we'll suppose that V is in A, and then we can use this to get that V is in B. So we have V is in B. So clearly this bottom statement also implies this stop statement. So to summarize, um, saying this is equivalent to saying this, saying this is equivalent to saying this, and saying this is equivalent to saying this. So yes, A is contained in B, if and only if A intersection B is equivalent to A. Um, pretty much just like what happens in the category of sets. <clears throat> so another interesting thing about pullbacks is we can use them to shed light on this question of whether an arrow is a monic or not in general. Okay, so say we have an arrow F from A to B. Well, it turns out that that arrow is going to be monic if and only if this is a pullback square. So if we take our pullback object as A and we use these identity arrows as projections, if this forms a pullback square, then it turns out F is monic and vice versa. So how can we prove this? Well, let's start by showing that F is monic implies that this is a pullback square. So we're assuming that F is monic, we want to show that this is a pullback square. So how are we going to do it? Well, Let's firstly note that this square commutes, okay, because f after the identity equals f after the identity. So far, so good. Now, the next thing is to show that this has the kind of universal property. So let's suppose that there is another object h with an arrow l and an arrow u such that f after l equals f after u. In other words, we're supposing that the outer perimeter of this diagram commutes. And since, and so now in order to prove that this is a pullback square, we want to show that there exists this unique intermediary arrow which makes the whole diagram commute. And we can do this because we're supposing that f is monic and so f after l equals f after u implies that l is equal to u. And now clearly um, setting this arrow here from h to a to be equal to u which is equal to l 
that is going to make this upper triangle commute and it's also going to make this lower triangle commute so this should be an acceptable kind of intermediary arrow but it's also the only one that works right because if we had some other arrow let's say k which was not equal to u or l um, then when we compose along here we'd be doing identity after k which would just give k well we have to have that that k will be equal to u so in fact this is the only arrow um, from h to a which could make these two triangles commute and that is the universal property um, for a pullback that we wanted to have so this proves that we do indeed have a pullback square when f is a monomorphism so okay we've shown that this implies this now can we go the other way around let's suppose that this is a pullback square and we want to infer that f is a monomorphism so we start the same way as usual we assume that we have two arrows u and v parallel arrows into a and we assume that f of u is f of l and we can think of these arrows u and l as arrows coming out of some object h and they're both arrows into a but i might as well draw them like this because i have two copies of a so i'm free to draw them like this there's no um, rule against it and um, now we can see that this condition f after u equals f after l is basically telling us that the outer perimeter of this diagram is going to commute so we're assuming that this square is a pullback and we have that the outer perimeter of this diagram commutes and that means there has to exist this unique k which is such that 1a after k is equal to l and 1a after k is equal to u and so this means and this equation here this implies that k equals l and this equation here implies that k equals u so we have that l equals u so we started with the assumption that f after u equals f after l and we have that u equals l so that proves that when this is a pullback square this arrow f here is indeed a monomorphism so it's quite remarkable then that this single idea of pullbacks can encode the idea of So it's quite remarkable then that this single idea of pullbacks can encode the ideas of categorical products, equalizers, and even monics, which are really a different kind of thing. They're a special kind of arrow, but we can even like test if an arrow is monical or not by looking at pullbacks. It seems as though this concept is really finding its way into lots and lots of kind of ideas that we're interested in. Okay, so one thing that I want to try and get across in this video is the importance of thinking about monics in terms of what arrows are in them. I mean, so there are various different kinds of operations and relations between monics, things like containment and intersection and inverse images. And each of those has a way to understand it in terms of which kind of arrows are in the monic. And so when we reduce things to those kind of terms, we kind of put everything into a common language. And it's often then quite sort of almost mechanical to check if certain facts hold. So here's a, another example of this kind of thing. Um, we want to prove this result in green, which says that if this monic A is contained in this monic B, supposing we have these two sub-objects A and B of Y here, 
and we're saying that a is if a is contained in b then f to the minus 1 of a is contained in f to the minus 1 of b so here we're assuming that f is an arrow from x to y and of course f to the minus 1 of a is the pullback of a along f and similarly f to the minus 1 of b is the pullback of b along f and so we want to show that if a is contained in b then f to the minus 1 of a is contained in f to the minus 1 of b so how are we going to do it well it suffices um, to show that we have the right kind of behavior for arrows into x so let's just consider a completely general arrow v from some object h into x now one of our previous results is that um, saying that one monarch is contained in another is equivalent to saying that every arrow that's in the first monarch is in the second monarch. So that's all we have to show. We just have to show that if V is in F to the minus one of A, then it follows that V is in F to the minus one of B. And that will prove this result. So let's start with that assumption that V so that's all we have to show that if v is in f to the minus 1 of a then v is in f to the minus 1 of b so let's start with that assumption that v is in f to the minus 1 of a now a result about these inverse images is that that v is going to be in f to the minus 1 of a if and only if v f of v is in a and since a is contained in b this implies that f of v is in b okay so if this is in a then it has to be in b because a is contained in b and then this again by the kind of inverse images idea is equivalent to saying that v is in f to the minus one of b so we have that this implies this hence this statement in green holds true Okay, so in this video, we're seeing lots of the virtues of pullbacks, but in the last video, we spent a long time looking at products and equalizers. So were we just looking at the wrong kind of limits? Are pullbacks just more important? Well, not exactly, because it turns out that you can construct pullbacks using equalizers and products. And here is a description of how to do it. So, so to think about this, let's just consider a pullback square like this one here for f and g. Now, the main object of the pullback is this object L here. And we can ask ourselves a simple question, which is, what are the generalized elements of this L? Um, so remember, a generalized element is just an arrow into this L. And so what we see is that a H element of L, in other words, an arrow K into L from H, is going to correspond to a pair of a H element in A and a H element of B, such that doing F on the H element of A gives the same result as doing G on the H element of B. Okay, so we could think of a h element of l as corresponding to a kind of pair x comma y such that f after x equals g after y and this is pretty much um, how pullbacks look in the category of sets and that would correspond to a case where we're thinking about the situation where h is a terminal object and also you can use this kind of rationale um, thinking about H being a HOM functor, if you want to understand the structure of pullbacks in these categories um, of functors into set and so on. Um, so it's a useful kind of perspective, but it's also suggestive um, because basically what we're saying is that the kind of H elements of L are these pairs, so it's sort of like a product idea, but also with um, some idea that we can do operations on 
the elements in these pairs and get the same thing, which has a sort of aspect reminiscent of that of equalizers. So this really suggests how we can construct general pullbacks in terms of, so this kind of suggests how we can construct general pullbacks using products and equalizers. So these are the precise details, okay? Let's suppose in a general category, um, we have an arrow F from A to C and an arrow G from B to C. And let's suppose we also have a product of A and B. So that has a projection P1 into A and P2 into B. I'm underlining the arrows associated with products because I'm using the same kind of symbols um, when I'm talking about products and when I'm talking about um, pullbacks. So I'll just underline the arrows associated with the product to make sure um, you know whether I'm talking about, for example, a product projection or a pullback projection. Um, so, okay. Now, let's suppose that we have an equalizer E of these parallel arrows, F after P1 and G after P2. Well, we can use those to form a pullback square. So the claim then is that if we take this equalizer E um, of these two arrows here, F after P1 and G after P2, um, and then we form these arrows, P1 after E and P2 after E, then this is going to be a pullback square. And it's going to be a pullback square for these arrows F and G that we're interested in. Okay, so this tells us how, if we can construct a product and an equalizer for these kind of arrows, how we can use them to make a kind of pullback square for a general kind of corner like this. And then the converse of this result says that if we have a kind of pullback of F and G, so let's say something like this, where here this P1 and P2 are really like pullback projections. They're just arrows involved in making this pullback. Well, if we have a general kind of pullback for F and G, then there's going to be an arrow from the sort of object L of this pullback to A times B. And that arrow is actually going to be the equalizer of these arrows okay so this is the sort of converse and what is this arrow well we might call this arrow p1 comma p2 underlined okay because it's a kind of paired arrow because it's going into a categorical product um, but i'm underlining it because it's this notation, um, you know, with the brackets and comma and things is to do with categorical products. That's why I'm underlining it. I said I'd underline arrows which are associated with the categorical products. But it's a little confusing because the actual components, um, the bits inside this pair, these are actually projections associated with this pullback. But anyway, um, the point is that this arrow here is then the equalizer of this kind of, the point is that this arrow here is then an equalizer of these two arrows, F after P1 underlined and G after P2 underlined. So that's a basic description of the result. I'll leave it up to you um, if you wanna try and prove this, um, or you could look it up. Uh, it's discussed, um, I think it's Colin McClarty's Theorem 4.5, and. I think it's Colin McClarty's Theorem 4.5 in Elementary Categories, Elementary Toposes. And it's a fairly useful result because, um, for example, in my last video, I uh, described um, how we can make all these things like um, products and equalizers. And this result basically tells you how you can combine those things to get pullbacks.
So this is a fairly useful result. For example, in the last video, I spent quite a while explaining how one can construct products and equalizers in this category set to the power of C. And um, now you can construct pullbacks in those kind of categories as well, because this result tells you how to make pullbacks out of products and equalizers. And the jewel of this result um, tells you how you can make pushouts out of co-products and co-equalizers. Okay, so I don't want to put too much theory in one video. And so the last thing I was talking about was how we can make pullbacks out of products and equalizers. And I stated a result without proof. Um, and so if you have a look um, in the description of the video, um, you'll find some uh, links to videos where you can see I go through these kind of arguments in full detail. And um, there's some other results uh, that I want to um, just discuss briefly. And again, you can find proofs in the description. And these are so-called pullback lemmas. So these are important results about how pullbacks combine with each other. And this one here, well, this one I'm illustrating here is especially important um, because we use it quite a lot when we're thinking about subobjects and topos theory. Um, but the proof is a little involved. It's, it's not complex, but there's a lot of diagram chasing and things like that. And so, um, again, you can look in the description of the video to find the proof. So let me just tell you what the claim is of this pullback lemma. Suppose we have a diagram like this. So I haven't drawn, so I haven't labeled the objects and the arrows, but you can see the kind of configuration I'm talking about. Of course, there'd be objects um, at these vertices here. Um, so let's suppose that this right square is a pullback square. Now this pullback lemma says that this left square is a pullback square if and only if this kind of outer perimeter of this diagram also forms a pullback square. Okay, so if you want to know more details about that or the proof, um, I encourage you to uh, have a look at the videos linked in the description. You can also look at um, Theorem 4.8 in Colin McClarty's book and um, also Theorems 4.9 and 4.10 um, talk about kind of more complex types of uh, pullback lemmas. So here's one example. Um, suppose we have a commuting triangle uh, formed with these arrows between these objects uh, B, C and D. So I suppose that this triangle at the top right commutes. And also um, suppose that these two kind of um, squares formed by this arrow coming into B, um, kind of away from us. Um, I'm supposing that this green highlighted square and this red highlighted square are both pullback squares. Well, in this case, um, there's going to exist a unique arrow like this, such that we have a commuting triangle here, and also then this kind of top region involving this new arrow and this arrow between C and D and these two arrows also forms a pullback square. Um, so you can then pr you can prove this result as a consequence of this more kind of basic and probably more important pullback lemma here. And there's yet another pullback lemma which is a bit more complicated but I'm not going to go through it at the moment. You can have a look in the uh, video in the description or in Colin McClarty's wonderful book if you want to see the details about these things. Okay then, so now we've seen all of these different results about pullbacks, it's time to double our money by noticing that there is a jewel to so many of these results. So what's the dual idea to that of a pullback? Well, it's the idea of a pushout. So one can think of a pushout 
as a co-limit of a diagram like this, where we have an arrow F from C to A and an arrow G from C to B. Um, alternatively, the kind of more explicit way of describing a push out is to say that it is an object M with an arrow I1 from A to M and an arrow I2 from B to M, such that for anything similar, for any object H with an arrow L from A to H and an arrow U from B to H, there exists a unique arrow K that makes this diagram commute in the sense that K after I1 equals L and K after I2 equals U. And so many of the results that I've discussed today have a kind of dual which is referring to push-outs. Um, so pretty much everything I've said, apart from the discussion about intersections, um, has this kind of dual um, which is referring to push-outs. Um, there is another idea, um, which is the idea of union, which you might think is kind of dual to the idea of intersection, but um, actually the idea of union is sometimes more complicated and it's, um, it's not so straightforward to get at just by simple dualization. Um, but the other results, for example, um, about how we can construct monics and products and equalizers out of pullbacks, they have dual results about how we can construct epics and co-products and co-equalizers out of push-outs. So many of the results can be generalized. And another one that can be generalized is how, I mean, I explained how we can make pullbacks out of products and equalizers. And in a kind of dual way, we can make push-outs out of co-products and co-equalizers. And I explained in the last video how to uh, make co-products and co-equalizers in this category, in these categories of the form set to the power of C. And so um, you should then be able to um, dualize that previous result I showed you, and um, then you can, and then you can figure out how to put those pieces together, the um, co-products and co-equalizers in this category, to make push-outs. Alternatively, um, I'll put a, a link to my video on pre-sheaves in the description and there I give an explicit um, description of how you can form co-limits um, in general in this category. And this is just a special kind of co-limit involving these things. Why would you want to investigate push-outs? Well, um, in a sense, they're just as interesting and important as pullbacks, but um, they're kind of dual, so there's lots of good reasons to study them. I mean, it's fairly easy to study push-outs um, once you know about pullbacks, because, you know, you already understand most of the proofs. It's just the arrows are going in the opposite direction, but the underlying concepts look quite different, and one gains all kinds of new intuition from looking at push-outs. Um, and one thing you can do with push-outs is stick two different structures together. So I thought just to um, sort of whet your appetite for maybe if you want to have a look at push-outs in this kind of category, here's an example. Okay, so um, let's um, take, we'll consider this category of graphs. So C here is um, just this category with um, two parallel arrows like that, okay? Um, and so we're considering this category of graphs and let's take C to be this singleton graph. We'll have A to be this terminal object, this single loop graph, and we'll have B to be the single edge graph. And then F and G are these graph homomorphisms shown. So then we can say, okay, let's find a co-limit of this kind of diagram. And what does that correspond to? Well, basically it corresponds to getting these two structures here and taking the kind of co-product of them and then identifying 
the bits and pieces of them that have stuff commonly sent to them from this bottom right hand corner structure. So essentially we take these things and stick them together over the vertex and we get this. Okay, and that's in general how these um, kind of push outs work. Um, you can form push outs by combining co-products and co-equalizers in a similar way to how you can form pullbacks by combining products and equalizers. And so in generic figures and their gluings, um, the authors go into quite some detail about how you can construct so many different structures in these kind of categories of functors by getting things like your basic hom functors and just like gluing them together um, repeatedly to form um, like really complex objects. And it's very interesting to see how one can do this in a kind of general setting, one sort of investigating how one can stick together shapes to make other shapes, but in a language which is, um, you know, not really being too, so specific about what kinds of shapes you're attaching. You're sort of investigating the kind of underlying, um, you're kind of investigating the underlying concepts behind kind of constructing figures by gluing them together.